going to continue reading from Fritjof Schuon's Understanding Islam, the chapter on the Quran, page 47. Like the world, the Quran is at the same time one and multiple. The world is a multiplicity which disperses and divides. The Quran is a multiplicity which draws together and leads to unity. The multiplicity of the holy book, the diversity of its words, aphorisms, images and stories, fills the soul and then absorbs it and imperceptibly transposes it into the climate of serenity and immutability by a sort of divine ruse. And there's a footnote there which I'll read now in the sense of the Sanskrit term upaya. The soul which is accustomed to the flux of phenomena yields to this flux without resistance. It lives in phenomena and is by them divided and dispersed. Even more than that, it actually becomes what it thinks and does. The revealed discourse has the virtue of accepting this tendency while reversing its movement thanks to the celestial nature of the content and the language, so that the fishes of the soul swim without distrust and with their habitual rhythm into the divine net. Footnote 15. This is true of every sacred scripture and is notably true of Bible history. The vicissitudes of Israel are those of the soul seeking its Lord. In Christianity, this function of transforming magic appertains especially to the Psalms. End of footnote. To the degree that it can bear it, the mind must be infused with a consciousness of the metaphysical contrast between substance and accidents. A mind thus regenerated keeps its thoughts first of all on God and thinks all things in him. In other words, through the mosaic of passages, phrases and words, God extinguishes the agitation of the mind by himself taking on the appearance of mental agitation. The Quran is like an image of everything the human brain can think and feel. And it is by this means that God exhausts human disquiet, infusing into the believer silence, serenity and peace. I'm going to continue reading from Fritjof Schuon's Understanding Islam, the chapter on the Quran, page 49. In Islam, as also in Judaism, the revelation relates essentially to the symbolism of the book. The whole universe is a book whose letters are the cosmic elements, the dharmas, as Buddhists would say, which, by their innumerable combinations and under the influence of the divine ideas, produce worlds, beings and things. The words and sentences of the book are the manifestations of the creative possibilities, the words in respect of the content, the sentences in respect of the container. The sentence is in effect like a space or a duration comprising a predestined series of compossibles and constituting what may be called a divine plan. This symbolism of the book is distinguished from that of speech by its static character. Speech is situated in duration and implies repetition, whereas books contain affirmations in a mode of simultaneity. In a book there is a certain levelling out, all the letters being similar, and this is moreover highly characteristic of the Islamic perspective. But this perspective, like that of the Torah, also includes the symbolism of speech, which is then identified with the origin. God speaks, and his speech is crystallized in the form of a book. 
Clearly, this crystallization has its prototype in God, and indeed it can be affirmed that the speech and the book are two sides of pure being, which is the principle that both creates and reveals. However, it is said that the Quran is the word of God, not that the word proceeds from the Quran or from the book. First of all, the word is being, as the eternal act of beyond being of the divine essence. But taken as the sum of the possibilities of manifestation, being is the book. Then, on the level of being itself, the word, or according to another image, the pen, is the creative act, while the book is the creative substance. Footnote here says, according to Hindu doctrine, this is the divine prakriti. Back to the text. Here there is a connection with natura naturans and natura naturata, in the highest sense attributable to these concepts. Finally, on the plane of existence, or it could be said of manifestation, the word is the divine spirit, the central and universal intellect which brings about and perpetuates the miracle of creation, as it were, by delegation. In this case, the book is the sum of the crystallized possibilities, the world of innumerable creatures. The word is then the aspect of dynamic simplicity or of simple act, while the book is the aspect of static complexity or differentiated being. Or again, it can be said that God created the world like a book, and his revelation came down into the world in the form of a book. But man has to hear the divine word in creation, and by that word ascend towards God. God became book for man, and man has to become word for God. Man is a book through his microcosmic multiplicity and his state of existential coagulation, whereas God, when envisaged in this context, is pure word through his metacosmic unity and his pure principial activity. In Christianity, the place of the book is taken by the body with its two complements of flesh and blood, or bread and wine. In Divinis, the body is, first, the primary auto-determination of divinity, and thus the first crystallization of the infinite. Next, it is universal substance, the true mystical body of Christ. And finally, it is the world of creatures, the crystallized manifestation of this body. We have seen that God as being is the book par excellence, and that on the plane of being the pole substance is the first reflection of this book. The word, which is its dynamic complement, then becomes the pen, the vertical axis of creation. In contradistinction, man too has an aspect of word represented by his name. God created man in naming him. The soul is a word of the creator when envisaged from the aspect of its simplicity or its unity. I'll continue reading from Fritjof Schuon's Understanding Islam, the chapter entitled The Quran, page 51. The most obvious content of the Quran consists not of doctrinal expositions, but of historical and symbolical narratives and eschatological imagery. The pure doctrine emerges from these two sorts of pictures in which it is enshrined. Setting aside the majesty of the Arabic text and its quasi-magical resonances, a reader could well become wearied of the content did he not know that it concerns ourselves in a quite concrete and direct way. Since the disbelievers, the kafirun, and associators of false divinities with God, the mushrikun, and the hypocrites, the munafiqun, are within ourselves. 
Likewise, that the prophets represent our intellect and our consciousness. That all the tales in the Quran are enacted almost daily in our souls. That Mecca is our heart. And that the tithe, the fast, the pilgrimage and the holy war are so many contemplative attitudes. Running parallel with this interpretation, there is another which concerns the phenomena of the world around us. The Quran is the world both outside and within us, and always connected to God in the two respects of origin and end. But this world or these two worlds show fissures announcing death or destruction or to be more precise, transformation. And this is what the apocalyptic and eschatological surahs teach us. Everything that concerns the world also concerns us, and conversely. These surahs transmit to us a multiple and striking image of the fragility both of our earthly condition and of matter, then of the destined reabsorption of space and of the elements into the invisible substance of the causal protocosm. This is the collapse of the visible world into the immaterial, a collapse, to paraphrase St. Augustine, inwards or upwards. It is also the confronting of creatures torn away from the earth with the flashing reality of the infinite. By its surfaces, the Quran presents a cosmology which treats of phenomena and their final end, and by its pinnacles, a metaphysic of the real and the unreal. Not surprisingly, the imagery of the Qur'an is inspired above all by conflict. Islam was born in an atmosphere of conflict and the soul in search of God must fight. Islam did not invent strife. The world is a constant disequilibrium, for to live means to struggle. But this struggle is only one aspect of the world and it vanishes with the level to which it belongs. The whole of the Qur'an is also suffused with the tone of powerful serenity. In psychological terms, it could be said that the combative aspect of the Muslim is counterbalanced by his fatalism. In the spiritual life, the holy war of the spirit against the seducing soul and nafs al-Amara is transcended and transfigured by peace in God, by consciousness of the Absolute. It is as if in the last analysis it were no longer we who are fighting, and this brings us back to the symbiosis of combat and knowledge in the Bhagavad Gita, and also to certain aspects of the nightly arts in Zen. The practice of Islam, at whatever level, is to repose in effort. Islam is the way of equilibrium and of light which comes to rest upon that equilibrium. Equilibrium is the link between disequilibrium and union, just as union is the link between equilibrium and unity, which is the vertical dimension. Disequilibrium and equilibrium, lack of rhythm and rhythm, separation and union, division and unity. Such are the great themes of the Qur'an and of Islam. Everything in being and in becoming is envisaged in terms of unity and its gradations, or the mystery of its negation.
I'll continue reading from Fritjof Schuon's Understanding Islam, the chapter entitled The Quran, from page 52. For the Christian, what is necessary for coming to God is, quote, unreservedly to renounce oneself, as St. John of the Cross put it. And the Christian is astonished to hear from the Muslim that the key to salvation is to believe that God is one. What he cannot know from the outset is that everything depends on the quality, on the sincerity, ikhlas, of this belief. What saves is the purity or the totality of the belief, and that totality clearly implies the loss of self, whatever the form in which this is expressed. As for the negation of the Christian trinity in the Quran, and this negation is extrinsic and conditional, we must take account of certain shades of meaning. The Trinity can be envisaged according to a vertical perspective or according to either of two horizontal perspectives, one of them being supreme and the other not. The vertical perspective, beyond being, being and existence, envisages the hypostases as descending from unity or from the absolute or from the essence it could be said which means that it envisages the degrees of reality. The supreme horizontal perspective corresponds to the Vedantic triad Sat, Chit, Ananda. Sat, supra-ontological reality, Chit, absolute consciousness, and Ananda, infinite beatitude which means that it envisages the Trinity inasmuch as it is hidden in unity. Footnote 19. The Absolute is not the Absolute inasmuch as it contains aspects, but inasmuch as it transcends them. Inasmuch as it is Trinity, it is therefore not Absolute. Back to the main text. The non-supreme horizontal perspective, on the contrary, situates unity as an essence hidden within the Trinity, which is then ontological and represents the three fundamental aspects or modes of pure being, whence the triad being, wisdom, will, Father, Son, Spirit. Now the concept of a Trinity seen as a deployment, tajalli, of unity, or of the Absolute, is in no way opposed to the unitary doctrine of Islam. What is opposed to it is solely the attribution of absoluteness to the Trinity alone, or even to the ontological Trinity alone, as it is envisaged exoterically. This last point of view does not, strictly speaking, attain to the Absolute, and this is as much as to say that it attributes an Absolute character to what is relative and is ignorant of Maya and the degrees of reality or of illusion. It does not conceive of the metaphysical but not pantheistic identity between manifestation and the principle. Still less, therefore, does it conceive of the consequence this identity implies from the point of view of the intellect and the knowledge which delivers. Here, comment is called for on the subject of the disbelievers, the kafirun, namely those who, according to the Quran, do not belong, as do Jews and Christians, to the category of people of the book, Ahl al-Kitab. If the religion of these disbelievers is false, or if disbelievers are such because their religion is false, why have Sufis declared that God can be present not only in churches and synagogues, but also in the temples of idolaters? It is because in the classical and traditional cases of paganism, the loss of the full truth and of efficacy for salvation essentially results from a profound modification in the mentality of the worshippers 
and not from an ultimate falsity of the symbols. In all the religions which surrounded each of the three Semitic forms of monotheism, as also in those forms of fetishism still alive today, a mentality once contemplative and hence in possession of a sense of the metaphysical transparency of forms had ended by becoming passional, worldly, and, strictly speaking, superstitious. The symbol through which the reality symbolized was originally clearly perceived, a reality of which it is rigorously speaking an aspect, became in fact an opaque and uncomprehended image or an idol, and this decadence of the general mentality could not fail in its turn to affect the tradition itself, enfeebling it and falsifying it in various ways. Most of the ancient paganisms were characterized by intoxication with power and sensuality. There is assuredly a personal paganism to be met with even within those religions which are objectively living, just as conversely truth and piety may be actualized in a religion which is objectively decadent, in which case, however, the integrity of its symbolism is to be presumed. But it would be completely mistaken to believe that any of the great world religions alive today could, in its turn, become pagan. They have not the time to become so, and their sufficient reason is, in a sense, that they should endure till the end of the world. That is why they are formally guaranteed by their founders, which is not the case with the great paganisms that have disappeared. These had no human founders, and their perennial subsistence was conditional. The primordial perspectives are spatial and not temporal. Hinduism alone of all the great traditions of the primordial type has had the possibility of being renewed through the ages thanks to its avatars. In any case, our intention here is not to enter into details, but simply to make it clear why, from the point of view of some Sufi, it is not Apollo who is false, but the way of regarding him. I'll continue reading from Fritjof Schuon's Understanding Islam, chapter on the Quran, page 56. But to return to the people of the book, if the Quran contains elements of polemic concerning Christianity and, for stronger reasons, concerning Judaism, it is because Islam came after these religions, and this means that it was obliged, and there is always a point of view which allows of its doing so, it was obliged to put itself forward as an improvement on what came before it. In other words, the Quran enunciates a perspective which makes it possible to go beyond certain formal aspects of the two more ancient monotheisms. Something analogous can be seen not only in the position of Christianity in relation to Judaism, where the point is self-evident by reason of the messianic idea and the fact that the former is like a bhaktic esoterism of the latter, but also in the attitude of Buddhism towards Brahmanism. Here too the later appearance in time coincides with a perspective that is symbolically, though not intrinsically, superior. The tradition that is apparently being superseded clearly has no need to take account of this fact, since each perspective is a universe unto itself, thus a centre and a standard and since in its own way it contains all valid points of view. By the logic of things, the later tradition is condemned to the symbolical attitude of superiority, on pain of non-existence, one might almost say. But there is also a positive symbolism of anteriority, and in this respect the new tradition, which is from its own point of view the final one, 
must incarnate what came before, or what has always existed. Its novelty or glory is consequently its absolute anteriority. There's a footnote, number 26, after the sentence. By the logic of things, the later tradition is condemned to the symbolical attitude of superiority. This attitude is necessarily legitimate from a certain angle and at a certain level, and is explained in the field of monotheism by the fact that the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic religions correspond respectively to the paths of action, love, and knowledge, to the extent that they can, as exoterisms, do so with, and without prejudice to their most profound content.